Hey friends, welcome to the All Means All podcast. We're glad you found us. And we just want to say to you, if this is really kind of your God time, your church time, we're honored to be your church and I'm honored to serve as your pastor. And if you ever want to go a little deeper, you want to reach out, you want to share your story, you can email me at pastor at boisefumc.org and I'll try to respond and we'll get connected. Let's, let's jump into the podcast. Good morning, church. Welcome to the Cathedral of the Rockies. My name is Dwayne. I'm one of the pastors here. If you are searching for a church home and you haven't found it, we hope your search is over. We would be honored to be your church. If you're searching for a pastor, I'd be honored to serve as your pastor. You want to connect, whether you're online or in the room, we would be glad to connect with you. Feel free to shoot me an email at pastor at boisefumc.org and we'll find a time sit down, I can hear your story, share a cup of coffee or grab a beer and we'll we'll, um, get our lives connected and help you find a way to live out your call, who you are. Well, today we journey in the seven deadly sins with envy. And I saw how some of you watched when they delivered my coffee. I saw you. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. If you preach three times, they'll deliver your coffee too, all right? So there was a teacher, this is a very Idaho story, a teacher that said to the students, here's the lesson. I want you to go home and I want you to write down all of the people you envy. Don't write it on a piece of paper, said the teacher. Write it on a potato. Very Idaho story. (laughs) Write it on a potato, bring it back to class, we'll discuss it. So the students were pretty eager to write down the people that they envy. Some, the next day, brought a potato. Some brought a couple of potatoes. Some had a sack of potatoes. But the teacher didn't address it. She said, bring them back tomorrow. This happened over and over again. The students would carry their potatoes with them, and the teacher would not address it. And you may see where this is going. After a few days and weeks, the potatoes took on a life of their own, we might say. You noticed them before you got into the room. You smelled them where you, when you gathered, and they began to become a bother, an annoyance. The students had hoped that they could air their grievances. They were excited when the teacher said, write a name down on, of the person that you envy because they wanted to say, remember that person who we think of as great in that sport? They're really not that good. Or the person who always gets an A, well, you know why they get an A. Or that person whose family seems to have everything, well, you know why? They're, they wanted to air their grievances. But as the stench of rotting followed them to class... They became sick of this assignment. Finally, the teacher looked at them one day and said, the situation is very similar to what you carry in your heart when you don't like others. This hatred makes your heart unhealthy and you carry that envy and hatred wherever you go. And then they added, If you can't bear the smell of spoiled potatoes for a week, imagine the impact on your heart of this hatred that you carry throughout your life. The more people you envy, the heavier your soul. Wow. Envy. It's a part of all of our lives. It creeps in. It's one of the seven deadly sins. The Apostle Paul helps us understand how to balance envy a little bit in these holy words from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Very familiar words. You've heard them at every wedding you've ever attended. Let's put them up on the screen. Let's read these words out loud together. Would you read with me? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, 
always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Love does not envy. Wow. Envy is a feeling of discontentedness or a resentful longing aroused by someone else's possessions, qualities, or luck. John Chrysostom wrote this, a moth gnaws at a garment, so doth envy consume a person. Envy's one of the seven deadly sins. We know it. It, it, it creeps up on us in some ways in our life. I mean, maybe it's when you ride in your friend's brand new car. Or when you visit their house for dinner and they've remodeled their kitchen. Or sometimes it shows up when a, a buddy pulls out their pictures from spring break and they went somewhere more exotic than you even thought about. Or your friend's March Madness bracket that's still intact. <laughs> I mean, how could that be, right? Envy whispers in our ear why not me? Why not me? Why didn't I get this break? Why didn't this happen to me? Why don't I have this privilege? Envy's a deadly sin because it inspires us to look at God and say, the life that you have given me isn't enough. The next time you feel envy, picture yourself saying to God, the life you've given me isn't enough. Socrates called envy the ulcer of the soul. Well, Jesus speaks to this. Jesus tries to teach us what it's like if we would live on earth as, as in heaven, if we would live what he calls the kingdom of heaven, meaning if we lived as God intended us, created us to live. And he tells this story in Matthew 20. It's the least American story in the scripture. Chapter 20, verse 1. As Jesus was telling what the kingdom of heaven would be like, he said... Early one morning, a person went out to hire some workers for their vineyard. After they agreed to pay them the usual, um, after they agreed, he paid them the usual amount for a day's work. They sent them off to the vineyard. Pretty basic story. The story continues. Jesus says, a few hours later, the owner of the vineyard went out and found some others and said, why aren't you working? Well, nobody's hired us. Come and work in the vineyard. I'll pay you a fair wage. They go to work. A few hours later, he does it again, a few hours again, and at the end of the day, he goes out and says, why are you not working? Why have you been standing here all day? Nobody's hired us. Go work in the vineyard. Jesus says, when evening came, he called the foreman and said to the foreman, get the workers together and pay them their wages, beginning with those who were hired last. So those who maybe worked an hour. The workers who were hired at the 11th hour came and they were given an entire day's wage for one hour work. So those who came who were hired first, when they came, they expected, well, if you got a day's wage for an hour, man, what am I going to get? They expected to be paid even more. They too received a full day's pay. And they began to grumble. Verse 12. These who were hired last worked one hour. You, us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day, you've made them equal to us. The workers in the story, their joy is spoiled. See, their joy is spoiled <laughs> by comparison. As soon as we start to compare... Kathy and I, you may know, have four children, and years ago when they were little, envy would show up, and we would hear it almost daily. That's not fair, Dad. That's not fair, Mom. Why did she get that? Why did he get that? And I would answer as any loving parent would answer, because I love them more. <laughs> Most of them are in therapy. They knew it wasn't true when we said it. Why could I say that? Because they knew it wasn't true. We, we love them all equally. Most days. We try to love them all equally. 
but those in Jesus' story. You can understand, this is a non-American parable, isn't it? How It's not fair. How is it that those who worked an hour got paid what I get for a whole day? You've made them equal to us. Those of us who've borne the burden of work. Jesus finishes the story. But to the one who did the hiring, he answered them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to a, a full day's wage? Yeah. So take your pay and go. I want to give to the one who was hired last the same as I give to you. Don't I have the right to do that? Do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I was generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. We, we always, this is part of life. From first grade to eternity, we are always going, how do I stack up? Where do I fit in the pecking order? Whether it's at work or in the neighborhood or in the church, we're always trying to figure, where do I fit? Where, who am I ahead of and who's behind me? It's that mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all that creeps into all of our lives. So to be a self is to have an identity about where we stand in the pecking order. I often, when I travel, I, I, I have devoted myself to traveling with mostly one airline, Delta Airlines. Now, I travel with Delta. I fly enough that I've earned a little bit of status. And status, no, I'm not silver status. I'm not gold status. I'm platinum. <laughs> but I'm not diamond. And I'm not a million miler. So how status works, and before I had any status, I don't think I was even aware of it. I just got on at the end when they got everybody on. But after you get a little status, here's how status works. The million milers get on first. The service, those serving our country get on first, million milers. And then they let the next crowd, the diamonds, get on. And we all know who we are because our app tells us a different color and who, what status we have. And then after the diamonds come the platinum. And I know what color my screen is. And I'm very aware of those who are sneaking toward the front with the wrong color screen. <laughs> they didn't work the whole day. They didn't earn this status. They're trying to be equal to me. Now, I always think it's funny. We're all getting on the same plane. <laughs> We're all going to the same place. But because there's a little status, oh my goodness. Have you ever watched people jockey position to get on the same plane to go to the same town at the same time but know their status? Wow. Proverbs puts it like this. Chapter 14, verse 30. A heart at peace gives life to the body. But envy rots the bones. Wow. Envy's directly opposed to love. There's this old medieval French romance story uh, of St. Martin. And St. Martin comes into a town and there, he meets two, two people. And one's kind of covetousness, has co is full of coveting. The other one's kind of full of envy. But he says to both of them, I'll grant, I'll grant your wish. Whatever you wish, your friend gets double. This perplexed them for a moment because if I wish for a farm, he gets two farms. If I wish for gold, he gets twice as much gold. If I wish for silver status, he gets diamond status. I mean, so it, this perplexed them. And so the covetous one kind of sat back, but the envy one finally figured it out and said, St. Martin... Make me blind in one eye. Envy always belittles the other. 
Envy no longer sees the other as a child of God. Could it be that it was envy that caused the scribes and the Pharisees to persecute Jesus? Was it envy that had him condemned and crucified on the cross at Calvary? Envy is a cause of a lot of unhappiness. Maybe the only seven deadly sin that is not fun ever. The others have a moment of fun before they become problems. This one takes joy right away. Well, we have a spiritual problem, envy, so we need a spiritual solution. To overcome envy, we must regain the vision of who we are and whose we are, who we were created to be. If you get nothing else from today, the antidote to envy is love. You are a child of God made in the image of God. Jesus puts it like this in Matthew 22, verse 37. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind. It's the first and greatest commandment. The second, though, don't forget this, equally important. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love does not envy. The author Robert C. Roberts, an unfortunate name, Robert C. Roberts writes in his book, Spirituality and Human Emotion, the Christian self-understanding is that she's precious before God. Listen to that. Our, our understanding is that we are precious before God. However much a sinner, however much a failure or success, she may, be the, she may be by the standards of the worldly comparison and that every other person she meets has the same status. Everyone's diamond. Everyone has the same status. It goes on to say, this vision, when appropriate, is also the ultimate ground for self-confidence. For the message is this, that, the lo- that God loves me for myself, not for anything I've achieved, nor for my beauty or intelligence or righteousness, or for any other qualification, but simply in the way that a mother loves the fruit of her womb. God loves us because you are made in the image of God, right as you are. The antidote to envy is love. Well, let me give you the action steps. Here they are. Um, first one is this. Celebrate who God created you to be. I mean, when, when you get to from here to eternity, God's not going to go, why weren't you Moses? <laughs> or why weren't you Mother Teresa? But God might say, why weren't you you? Why weren't you you? I created you in my image. I gifted you to be you right where you were. Be you. Love in action. You may see on your seat or beside your seat a postcard. It looks like this. This is not a placeholder. It wasn't there to reserve the seat. It is for you to take with you and to think about what neighbor, what friend, what coworker, what family person would you say, you know, I would like you to join me in worship at 10 o'clock. I'd like you to come with me. Easter's coming. Palm Sunday's coming. If that doesn't work after Easter, we meet every week. You know, <laughs> Invite them to come. And, and then you have to go the next step. Because be specific. Would you come with me on this Sunday at this time? And then follow up. I'll pick you up or I'll meet you at the door. Because think about this. If you had never attended church what would it be like to walk in this building? Would you know what door to enter? I just saw somebody was trying to go to the 10 o'clock over at the 11 o'clock service, right? I mean, they didn't know. How do you know, right? Which, where's, where, where do we meet? Would they know it's okay to bring coffee in here, right? Would they think, oh, you can't do that? Would they know how to dress? Would they know how to stand up, sit down, fight, fight, fight? Would they know all that stuff if you can't model it for them, right? You model for them how to worship. Open the door for someone else to come with you. Maybe literally you can, we designed this so if you want, you can stick a stamp on it, send it as a postcard. You can deliver it if you want. If that's easier, you put it on your, put it on your cubicle at work, put it in your doorway. Maybe just a way to say, come, come join me. You matter to God. Come join me. So use that card in the next couple weeks. Second, love in action during these 40 days of Lent. We've been inviting you to look at your life and say, can I rid myself of 40 things? 40 pieces of clothes or tools or books? 
What are those things in your life that you go, you know what, these have some life in them and I don't really need this many coats, this many shoes, this many fill in the blank. And I could release them to someone who could, not so I can go, now I have room to get more. Not, not for that reason. But so you can say, my life is a little simpler and I've helped someone else out. 40 things. And then last, live love in action. As you participate in our diaper ministry, did you even know we had a diaper ministry? So for years, we have participated in the Idaho Diaper Bank where we buy diapers in bulk because some of our friends and family trying to make, make ends meet, they can't always purchase uh, diapers and wipes with, uh, on, with the money they have. And so we've created a way to extend, just like we do with the food bank, our food pantry, We've also extended people's life through our diaper ministry. So twice a week, moms and dads stop by and get diapers for their kids. This week, we, we helped 22 families, gave out 550 diapers. Wipes. And you say, well, how can I be a part of it? Two ways, you could say, you can stop at the desk out there and say, when, can I sign up and help share the diapers with those who are coming in? Sure. You could also say, I'd like to give some money to support that so we continue to do that. Almost, almost every family that comes in is a new American. Refugees, folks who are trying to make a new life, and you're helping them get their feet on the ground and become self-sufficient. You can be part of that. Let's pray. God, thanks for the privilege today to gather together. Thanks for this challenge around envy. This is a... It's a hard one. It creeps into our life, we confess, and takes away the joy of who you created us to be. Give us the grace to live in love. And when envy shows up, may we stop and may we celebrate the one we were coveting, we were envious of. Meet us here in this holy moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, remember these four things. You are, you are loved by and you matter to God. No crisis will last forever. There is always hope and others can help you. Just ask and then receive this benediction. May the peace of Jesus Christ go with you wherever God leads you. May God walk with you in the wilderness. May God hold you in the storms of life. May God bring you home rejoicing at the amazing things you've experienced together. May God bring you home rejoicing once again through these doors. In the name of Christ, amen.